Get this turned on, and I want to make sure everybody can hear okay and can see the screen okay. So if any of the attendees out there can hear me or can verify that the screen is coming through okay, just go ahead and hit your raise hand symbol on your control panel, and that just lets us know uh, that we're getting out. Good. Got some Richards coming in. They can. Perfect. All right. So like I was saying, today we're going to dive in and just cover some of the, the basics and the different areas of it and just start to take a look at it. A lot of these things we're going to touch on will be covered in more detail in upcoming uh, webinars that Mike will be doing as well. So keep an eye out for those. Really some good content coming up on this area of the software. Again, today's, uh, today's webinar is going to be covering just kind of a general overview of the five-axis milling and some different areas in that and how to uh, get a good look into it to start with. So again, anytime during the conversations that we're doing, you guys have questions, just uh, type them in the questions box there on your uh, control panel. I'll do my best to periodically glance over at that and answer you guys' questions as they come up uh, the best that I can. And we'll leave a little bit of time at the end of this to go over anything you guys need to as well. So we're going to go ahead and get started into this, and we're going to take a look at a couple basics with this. Now, the, uh, the five-axis portion of the software has some things we need to think about when going into it. Uh, a lot of people tend to just realize or look at the post. Okay, I need a five-axis post processor uh, to work with my machine. But when you get into the multi-axis portion of the software, whether it's four-axis, five-axis in this case, or even the multi-axis lays and so forth, there's more to it than just the post to get it to, to function properly uh, or produce the correct G-code and movements that are going to go out to the machine. And what we need to think about with this is there also is a virtual machine that is set up in the software to help generate the positional movements that are needed for that machine and travels. So these, this works hand in hand with the post processor to not only give the correct layout and G-code uh, format that that machine requires, but also the correct positioning, tilts, and movements. So it's very important that if you're using this portion of our software that you get with our tech support department, if you haven't already, to make sure we configure the correct machine and post processor uh, for your five axis milling application in this case. So once you've got all that completed and you're ready to go into a job, let's just bring up a basic example here to start with. And we're just gonna start with something simple. We're gonna start off with some basic indexing, stock setup, machine choosing, uh, things like that. And then we'll take a look at some of the different tool path strategies available in the multi-axis and some different ideas on how you can use your five plus two or three plus two to do different rough outs of different types of parts maybe instead of full simultaneous and things like that. Again, just to get our feet wet into the area. So here's a part that I'm gonna start with. Now this is just a basic little indexing part. It does have some different operations on it, some facing on different sides, some drill holes. Uh, here we have a center hole, you can do a pocket. This is an island with some taper on it. So you can do a three axis operation once you've tipped off to the uh, three plus two positioning there to do that. So a lot of different things where you can run a multi-axis to tip around and things like that. But for, the, for a couple options here, probably won't go through the whole part, but just a couple of the different strategies on this we're going to concentrate on indexing to start with. But this part also gives us the ability to start talking about uh, getting the cam tree set up, choosing the machine, setting up stock, zero, work offsets, things like that, and a few things to think about as you're going through it as well. So... Once we have our part, now this one we do have the grid turned off on, so this is our grid zero here. We still have the gnomon showing. We're going to come up to our cam tree. Again, remember you can access it through the cam icons in the new software and start a new job. We're going to do the milling, and then in here you want to make sure you have your machine that was set up by us for the uh, multi-axis portion of the software. So in this case, I'm going to use this 5-axis DMU50 machine that I have installed in here. Okay, so this is a table table configuration inside of here. So again, make sure you have the right one. If you're just playing around with it and testing out uh, some different things just to get familiar with the movements and stuff, you can use our default configurations. And again, think of the different configurations of your mill. So as you can see here, there will be a head head configuration where in this case, both, both rotary uh, or tilting axes are on the head of the machine, kind of like a gantry style router head uh, transform, head head transform style, head table. In this case, uh, one of the tiltings or rotaries is on the head, the other one would be on the table. Table table would be like the one I'm using or a Haas uh, 750 UMC where both rotaries are on the table style of the machine. So you wanna again think about the configuration of the machine, that's very important. 
in figuring out the positioning as it moves off and everything as it's moving around. So these are just some default ones that you can use just for playing around and getting comfortable with that do simulate uh, inside the software. So we're going to use this one here I have installed. And we're going to press OK, and that'll start our tree. And again, make sure you have the right post processor set with this one. For some reason, I don't. So I'm going to choose just a default one for now. We'll use the uh, table table. OK, so once that's set, now you're going to just do like any other job, and we're going to go in and set up our stock. But when we're in the stock page and the machine setup or the part zero, we have to think of a couple other things inside of here as well. So we're going to right-click on stock and go to the stock wizard. So again, you're going to set up your stock as you would. So let's say in this case I've uh, pre-cut a piece to maybe the outside of this shape just going straight up. So I could use like my wireframe stock. I could come down here and individually pick the bottom or right click and do a constant Z. And then this is where you would use your calculate stock button to generate that shape. So you can see my piece is actually sitting up in the air from the Z0 uh, of the screen. So in this case, you want to have your piece or think about your pieces. Okay, so when you build a custom machine in this case, the virtual machine zero is going to be the table center. Picture a, a flat table trunnion type machine and the uh, center top of that table or that platter would be your virtual machine home, okay, or zero. So now we need to represent the part away from that as it would be on the machine. So in this case, I don't have a vise in, loaded into this file, but let's say there was a vise sitting on here, and this was sitting up on top of the vise. So my piece is sitting up in the air from that the distance away. Now I can simply come over here and change my top of stock. I happen to know where this is, 9 inches, and this is 4 inches thick. So you can see by using the wireframe, I'm able to define a custom shape stock. So then when I hit Next... You're going to see me be able to choose your origin just like you would off of the uh, standard positions here. So we're going to state that we're zeroing our piece up on the top center of the part. Now, if we just leave it here and move on and press OK, we're probably not going to get the right movements out at the machine or be able to simulate it properly. What we have here is we have a piece that is uh, nine inches away from the uh, tabletop. So when you start tilting that trunnion and that thing starts rocking to its side, you know, as it's, uh, as it's r rotating off here. So if you had your trunnion over here and this piece is nine inches away, depending on how much it tilts and where your zero is will determine how much it needs to move and X and Y and so forth to get to the different positions for locating. So we have to set up what's called a, a, a virtual work offset, kind of like the work offset on a machine. Where is our zero on the part in reference to that zero of your virtual machine? In this case, our zero for the virtual machine is at the top center of the platter. So in this case, I'll come down here to work offset, and I'm going to put nine inches in here. So I could really have that sitting down there close. As long as I've set these values correctly, this lets the machine know how far away my zero is from that center. So when it tips, how much to calculate the different movements. Now, if I wasn't directly at the center in X and Y, I would put those values in here as well. And then simply press OK. And we'll be able to verify this in simulation with this machine. So now that I've got the work offset um, set, we can press OK. And then we can just simply come up here on stock, right click, and hit blank to visually hide it. Now we're ready to start machining. So very important that you have the right machine chosen with the right kinematics in the background. The stock set up properly, the zero set, and the work offset set as well to specify where that part is in relation to your machine zero. So now we're ready to start applying tool paths to this. Let's start with a simple facing operation. So let's say we want to index to this face here. We'll start with this one. And we want to do a simple facing, maybe take a tool, come back and face down to that level. So we need to index. We're going to come over to Machine Setup, we're going to right-click, we're going to go to Additional Functions, and we're going to add an index. Now, when you're in the index, you're going to get some options on how you can set this up. Up at the top, you have the option to pick off of a surface or a UCS creation. And we're going to talk about this in another file here in a minute. I'm going to show you a different way to set this. But in this case, when we have nice flats on the part or flat surfaces, we can just pick off of those and the software will line up to those as needed. So in this case, we're going to use the Pick Surface option. 
And then we'll also be able to reverse the direction that that, that index is pointing, as well as choose how the indexing is being handled from the machine settings for the posting parameters or if it's using a transform plane like a G68.2 or something of that case. And again, in the upcoming webinars, we dive into these specific topics. We'll cover these uh, options in more detail. So for now, we're just going to stay with pick a surface, use machine setting, and I'm going to come over here and pick on the surface that I want to index to. So notice it shows me the uh, normal for that index. And off of our machine zero we set, it's going to know how much to tip the machine to line up to that surface. So once we have that set, we're simply going to press OK. So now you'll see your index here in the tree. These can be renamed. A lot of people ask if you can rename this. Yes, you can. You can add on the end of it what the degree position, which operation it is, things like that to help you understand if you start having multiples of these set up in the cam tree. So now that we've got the index system in the cam tree, the next step is very important. We need to assign the toolpath to that index system. So you're not going to go back to machine setup to go to the toolpath. You want to make sure you right click on the index system to get to the toolpath for that so it assigns it to that position. So in this case, we're just doing a two axis toolpath facing. So we'll go into the wizard and we're going to work it like we normally would. So I'm just going to come in here. You know, if I didn't have all those holes on there, I could probably pick the surface and you might be able to get away with that still. So you can see by just picking the edges, it shows the shape. If you want to have a pre-drawn offset shape that you want to use, you can pick anything like that. Um, so here we can set the top of the feature and the depth that we want to cut down to. So if I hit pick bottom and pick that edge, it'll tell me the depth that we're going to cut down. So we're going to cut from uh, inch and a half, and we'll adjust those as we go. Sometimes when you get into five axis tipping, uh, I recommend just going through the toolpath first, getting the, the settings set, calculate it, take a look at it, and come back in and make a couple adjustments. So here's your rapid plane and feed plane. And again, make sure these values are enough or high enough that when you rotate, uh, when you pull off, you have enough room to rotate and tip around the piece as needed. So then we'll hit next. So for this, we're just going to do the facing operation. We don't need any tabs for this operation, so we're going to move past those. Uh, we're going to leave it on the G54 setup because that's what we're running right now. Multi-axis settings, we're just going to work off of what was created for the machine that we have installed, so we don't have to change anything here. Now for the tool. So again, what are we using to face off the end of this? So maybe in this case, we're using a one-inch tool. Again, you can go into your library, pick from there, assign tool holders, all that stuff as well. Maybe I'm using a one-inch holder inside of here. You can set the protrusion length. Remember, you can uncheck this and set how much this is hanging out of the holder here as well. Don't forget your speeds and feeds over here. How fast are you running, whether you're working off the materials and so forth. Set up your facing parameters. We're just going to do a zigzag. I like to set the on work piece. What that setting means is as it comes over to turn, uh, it's keeping the tool on the work piece by a percentage of tool. So if I put 50 in here, that means it brings the center of the tool right to the edge and turns back and forth for you. What direction are we going across it? Where is it starting? How much is the step over? Maybe we'll give it a little shift of a quarter inch in here. So it moves that first pass of the center of the tool right at the edge to on the piece a little bit more. We're taking this in one step or multiple steps. Maybe we'll take this in uh, 200,000 steps. Lead in and out, so we can do a parallel or a vertical. In this case, we're going to do 600, so it's a little more than the radius of the tool when it comes down. Uh, you can have it turn directly or curve through an arc type motion as it spins around there. We'll leave the arc on. And then you can set up your advanced feed rates for your lead in and out, and then we'll just compute that. So there you can see my facing going down the sides of that. Now, if we come back and look at our stock here against this, we can see that we're roughing from the top of that down, so that depth is pretty good. It knew where the stock was in relation to our surface off of the index. Uh, so a lot of material to face off there. Again, all your different tool parameters that you can use. I have a question from uh, Randy. It says, do we have the constant Z option? Um, can you explain that a little more, what you're looking for with the constant Z option uh, inside of there? And I'll, be, I'll get back to you on that and see if I can answer that for you. 
So once we've got that set, one other thing I like to do is utilize some of the other features in the software as well. And if we look at this, we might come in here and say, you know what, I want to make sure I clean across from one side to the other. I can actually come over here and right click and edit these toolpaths. Remember, you still have the toolpath editor inside of your software. So maybe I want to turn on extend. And you see how I can extend it by a percentage or a distance to actually make sure I'm cleaning off farther each way. So then I can actually execute that, okay it. So now I've got a longer path. So I just wanted you to see that, that you can use that even in the indexes and things like that to extend paths, modify them and so forth. Don't forget that that toolpath editor is in there. Okay, you were talking about during the selection. Um, yes, you do have that, but also remember you're not tipped up. We'll try it on the next one and make sure it is still selecting off of the constant Z. Um, in that case. So great question. We'll take a look at that on the next uh, surface we pick for you. So here you can see we've got that face down to size. All right. So let's say we want to come over here. I'm just going to jump around a little bit and let's say we want to face down to uh, this one here to this level here as well. So we want to do the same thing. We need another index. So we're going to go back to machine setup. Let's actually hide this first so we don't have to look at that by just blanking it out. We're going to come up here. We're going to go to additional functions. We're going to add another index in here. The surface I'm going to pick for this is right up on the top of that. So that's my index. So I'm going to press OK because we're using the surface again. And now I'm ready to cut. Now, do I want to go through the whole wizard again? No, I want to reuse what I've already done. Uh, we can still take advantage of the advanced features of the cam tree. We can reselect and copy this. We can come down here and paste it in. Um, yes, I'm going to use the same depth. So I'm going to come in and modify it, though, uh, to the new depth to the top of the boss there. So we come in here to select our geometry. What he was asking is if we can right-click on here and do a constant Z. And yes, you can, because uh, you're tipped off. Either way you want to do that, just think of how you're selecting. If you were in a multi-axis surface-based pass and you were tipped up, that really isn't a constant Z. But since the index is pointing that direction, it sees that on the constant Z level and you're able to select that way. Good question, though. So then over here, I'm just going to change my depth to this level. Uh, it's not quite as deep, and then press OK. Or is it the same? All right, so then if I'm using all the same parameters, I can just compute the path, and I'm just facing down to that level. Again, if you want to do the extension, you can come in here and edit it, go to the extend, and then just OK that to create it. So. Again, with the indexes, very easy to pick off of the surfaces. Use the copy and paste if you're going to repeat the same feature onto the next index system. So now we're using the ability to place new index systems into the tree. If you have a piece that is symmetrical around, like for instance, we're going to change topic real quick while we're talking about this and come back to that. I'm going to open up this cube. So here's a piece that I have four flats and four sides and stuff, the little wood piece, let's say, that I did some work on. And in my tree, I set up my stock as a cube, got the zero, in this case, on the bottom for the machine that this was set up for. Did an index to the first one, did the face. Did an index to the next one, did the face. Okay, everything works just like we just saw on the last piece. But if we come down here a little bit farther, you're going to see I do an index system to the side. And then this side is actually getting some uh, which one is it? Is getting some pocketing artwork cut into the side of it. So in here you can see I've picked the geometry and done the pocket on that index. But instead of again adding another index and doing this side, adding another index and doing the next side and so forth, what I've done is I've used the toolpath pattern option in the cam tree to rotate that index around with copies. This feature will actually allow you to do this and save you from having to reapply a new index in the tree every time. So if you know that you have the ability to define a specific axis, axis of rotation and set the spacing and copy amounts, you can do that. So inside of here, if we take a look, you can see I went to the rotate option, which is this one here turned on the 3D option, 
told it my angle of rotation, so I have every 90 degrees. I already have one, so I want three more. And I define the rotation axis, in this case, is the Z, um, going right up the center. And by doing that, if I unblank this whole index, you'll see it just rotated around with copies for me off of the one index that I selected. So again, think about what you're trying to do and how you're trying to cut on your piece. You might be able to save yourself a lot of work in the cam tree um, if it's the same thing evenly spaced around a known axis uh, that you can define. You can use the toolpath pattern to achieve that. If not, you can place another one in the tree and use the copy and paste, pick your new geometry and compute like we did before. But I wanted you to see that option real quick there. So back over to this one, I'm just going to blank this out real quick. Again, once you've done the index, everything is working off of that plane. If we wanted to drill holes on top of this one, we could come up here. We could go to the drill wizard, select our geometry. Again, we can come in here and pick right off the bodies of the holes. Once you're in the index, you're just working your tool pass as you would for any other part you're doing. So there you can see my diameter and my depth. You can see my top of feature and depth there. You can set your retracts. Let's just say we're going to do a quick center drill and drill. I'm just going to go through the settings pretty quickly here. I'm sure you guys have gone through these already inside the software. We'll use the default center drill. 80 thousandths deep. Don't forget to click in the boxes to get the pictures to help you decide how you're setting things. There's our 312 drill with a 118 tip. Maybe we'll turn on pecking and then we'll just compute that. So I'm able to do the drilling right off of the index. So indexing is very easy to do inside of here, whether we're applying a two axis, a three axis type cut to it. You know, we can come inside of here as well. Remember, we've indexed to this one. We face down to that level there. Maybe we want to come in here and do a three axis. I'm going to select the oop, little internet delay there. Let's clear that out. Select the whole thing. Uh, pick a boundary control. Pick like an advanced rough. We can do three axis once we've indexed off. We'll use maybe a, I'm just going to throw a quarter inch tool in here. I'm not quite remembering how big that piece is. All your different settings, your parameters inside of here. Allowances that you want to leave. I can override the top of the job and pick where I want that to start cutting down at. And we'll just recognize flats and let's just compute that out real quick. Could have increased the tolerance to save a little calculation time. But again, what I wanted you to see is when you go into the index, that's the most important setup part. The rest of it is just applying tool pass that you would normally do on a two axis or three axis job. Indexing gives you a lot of power to be very efficient with your cutting and not have to rely on multi ax the different axes constantly moving. You can get it locked to a position, go in and run a normal three axis cut or two axis cut on the piece. So you can see that allowed it to work with that. If I want to go off the sides a little more, I just offset my boundary a little bigger. Go and use your tool editing options as well. So whether it's a two axis axes or three axis toolpath, uh, the index is what's important there. Anybody have any questions on the indexing so far? Again, just a little overview to it. Again, watch for upcoming uh, webinars that will be diving deeper into each of these topics as we go forward. Okay. So the next thing I want to start taking a look at is some of the uh, simultaneous type uh, five axis milling strategies and how you can use those and the different ones we have in the software. So we're just going to be touching on a few of them here and giving you kind of an overview to these. These are here inside machine setup or up at the top and they're in the mill multi axis category. All right. So when you go into here in the five axis package, we do actually have a couple different options for you in here. You have the wireframe. This is kind of like a, uh, another word would be like a trimming uh, tool path. This works off of edges or wireframe geometry where you're going to define the tilting lines and the path and which way it's offsetting and things like that. You also have the multi-axis roughing. Now, a, a couple differences here in these. We do have um, two packages of five-axis milling. We have a five-axis standard and we have a five-axis pro. 
The main differences in those is the five axis standard will give you the positioning, like what we were just talking about, and it'll give you the wireframe trim toolpath. The rest of these are toolpaths that are in the five axis pro package. You have the multi axis roughing. This lets you pick a piece that has a common floor shape and it'll allow you to go in and do a roughing, kind of like a five axis pocketing routine. That toolpath does have the advanced or adaptive roughing strategy like you would see in two axis pocketing and three axis advanced roughing, that high speed uh, tricoidal type toolpath. Uh, so we have that one available. You have your swarf or wall um, machining toolpath. It kind of works like the wireframe, but has more automated controls inside of it. You're not worried as much as picking the tilt lines. You can pick a front and a back. You can have it automatically adjust. A lot of nice controls with that. So this is a really nice one if you're doing a lot of wall finishing uh, with the sides of the tool. The surface base pass. These are ones you're going to use on all kinds of stuff. Remember, if you get into this package, these are all available to be used as three-axis tool paths as well, which would be considered our three-axis premium, uh, if you're familiar with that. These are great paths to give you a lot of motion and cuts. I actually have a part that we're going to look at uh, some of these on and how I applied them. Uh, but think about, again, what you're trying to cut when you look at these. We have a parallel cuts, cuts along a curve. So when you can see this case, this is the, the curve, curve mean wireframe that was defined and the cuts perpendicular to the curve, morph between two curves or edges, so you can pick off a wireframe edge or edges of surfaces, and you can see it starts as one as the shape of the toolpath, and then starts morphing itself as it patterns across the piece to match your second edge on the other side. We have parallel to multiple curves. I kind of consider this like my five axis profile. So I'm gonna pick an edge uh, or a wireframe of a, uh, along a surface and then I'm going to pick my drive surfaces and I can pattern off of it or just kind of like profile down the sides of it. You can even step down the surface versus side stepping in. It's nice controls there. Project curves, we'll look at this one too. Uh, this one's really nice also. This is like the project curves in the three axis just with the multi-axis functionality and tilting. It allows you to take any wireframe shape or edges of a surface and project it onto the surface as the cut path and it can even be you know patterned in a way off of it. Morph between two surfaces, just like the morph between two curves, but in this case, it's using the walls to watch out for as it's patterning over. So if this wall was kind of leaning in at the top, you don't want to pick the edge because then your tool will come into the wall unless you gouge check it. This actually gives you the ability to have it use the wall as the guide along the drive surface. And then we have a parallel to surface, kind of like the other one, but uses the surface, and then a flow line. This one follows the normals of the surfaces, and now you can pick multiple surfaces inside of one tool path. So some nice options inside of here. Now a lot of these are going to give you the same result. It's just different ways of selecting geometry. So you really want to think about what you're trying to achieve with the tool path and what you have to select for your geometry. And that's really going to point you in the right direction on which one of these tool paths to use uh, inside of here. So let's take a look at a couple of these uh, and how you might want to use them. Let me open something up real quick. I forgot to grab that one. Apologize here. And again, if anybody has any questions, just feel free to type them into the questions box as we're going along. Again, I'll do my best to uh, answer this for you. Oh, a little brain cloud there. Let's see. I wanted to go to... I have too many parts. <laughs> Apologize. Yeah, let's grab this one. Can't remember what it is, but we'll take a look at it. That's just telling me it's an old file and the machine doesn't exist in here anymore. So we're going to have some fun with one I haven't used in a while. All right, so let's change this machine up. Obviously, a three-axis mill is not going to work for this. Uh, we're going to hop over here to the, uh, we'll do that same five-axis. And that actually reminds me, you know, we talked about at the beginning how to choose the right machine, how to set up the stock, how to assign the machine zero. How to adjust the work offset. We went in and we did some indexing, but I never actually showed you that in simulation. So let's actually go back there and take a look at that first. So here we've done a couple cuts on this machine. So let's come up here and launch the simulation. Again, along with those five axis machines, you know, when we set up the machine for you, if we have or you have or we have the ability to work with you or the machine vendor to get the actual files of the machine, as you can see, we can pass those along to simulation. 
makes it really nice because you can turn on collision settings and controls and things like that in here and make sure all of your different axes are not going to collide. Uh, you can set travels, limitations, and things like that. This one's a little extravagant, as you can see uh, with the piece. But you see how the piece is sitting off the table. That's that definition we gave it in the machine setup. So this gives you a really good example. Let's actually hide the uh, machine housing here temporarily. And then we can actually come over here. We can come into our axis controls, slide this over, maybe a little more. And so here we have the different ones. We have the B and the C axis. So you can see I can do one tilting here, and I can do the other one rotary here uh, manually. But you can see if I was straight, and that piece was on the table, and I tipped up a certain amount, it's going to be down here more. So the distance you're moving over and the distance you're moving down is going to be different depending on where that piece is in relation to that table center. And like I was saying, this is going to look like it's going to slam through the piece real quick. Um, but you can see that's our virtual machine home, like I was saying. The face of the spindle at the top center of the platter table, in this case, for this machine. So what we were setting before was like a work offset uh, inside of here or a virtual shift to let it know how far away that zero was from the platter to position the part so that way it can be tilted around. Um, I had a question from John in here. Would you would you have a separate UCS for every separate surface of the part? So tenor, so UCS is per part. Well, if you're using the UCS as an index, well, it, then it just depends on how many indexes you're doing. You're going to have the main one, which is your main, you know, machine setup zero in this case, uh, where all of your locating is done off where you pick up your part. So when you're thinking about your piece, um, and you need to index off if that piece of which I'm going to bring up a piece here and I'm going to show you in a little bit as well. I can show you that if that piece doesn't have a selectable surface for the index, yes, you're going to need to create a UCS or you can pick from the existing top, front, side, back and do a reverse if you need to off of those. But if it's a custom angle and there's no flat surface to pick, yes, you will define a custom UCS in your UCS tree. And then you will switch to that option in the index and it will allow you to pick from that list of custom UCSs that you created. Now, those will be over here in your UCS manager, not in here. Just the different indexes will be in here for all the different tiltings that you're going to do to your different positions uh, for the indexing. Now, when you're indexing, is turn to that position and then do your work, not simultaneous tilting like we're going to take a look at in a second. So hopefully that answers that question for you there. Let me know if it did and I'll dive into a little more if I can. So again, I wanted you to be able to see uh, that there. So if I come over here and do a restart, you can see that. And if I come back over and turn the machine housing on, again, a little much there if you ask me. You can make it transparent and so forth. And you're just going to come in here and watch it cut out just like, again, it was out of the machine. But anything collides, you can set up collisions between the fixturing, the tool holder, the platter, the spindle, all that type of stuff as well. Anything over travels, it'll pop up alarms and say, I'm sorry, I can't cut that. I've over traveled in this axis by this amount. So very nice. But it's very important that the machine is set up and set properly to go along with the post. A lot of people uh, don't realize that this is actually going on in the background and that they can just open the software up and start programming. No, it's very, very important that you guys get with support. Make sure you've got the right machines uh, chosen, set up, things like that as well. Uh, so you can get that accomplished inside of there. So there you can see the different work we did on that piece. I'm almost going to stop it there to save some time. Um, wait for it to close down. So before we hop into that other one and talk about the simultaneous, since that question did come up about the UCSs, I have this piece here. This is one I did in our little pocket NC five axis mill that we have here in the office that we took to the trade shows. Um, one of the pieces we had on display that we were running was just a little small skull, about an inch or a couple inches in size. Um, but when I did this, I did it all in three axis cutting, just indexing around on the piece. So if you look at my tree over here, this is just the rough out one. Uh, the, I have another cam tree I did to the finishing just to break it apart. Do I did it on different days. 
uh, in the office. But you can see all of it is indexing. So you have your standard machine set up. This machine's a little funky on how you set it. So that's your main zero uh, of the piece. And then I did an index. Now, if I come over here and just made the stock see-through, uh, you'll notice there's nothing flat to pick off of, like I was saying there on this. So for this one, all I did was I picked off our UCS. And I just have my standard top, front, and side UCS. So when I chose the, uh, the UCS as the top, then you can use the reverse to get it going or whichever one you did you can use the reverse to get it going in the right direction there so if i did switch it to the uh in this case it would be the side um, and then you can use the reverse to choose which way you're pointing off of so very easy to do to set those up inside of here side one uh, side one as well side two which i picked the same one and just reversed it um, then come down to this one that's back and then front just reverse the other way so again you can go over to your UCS's uh, maybe I can talk to them about scheduling a nice webinar to go through setting up UCS plane creations things like that layers uh, different controls of that sort because uh, that will go a long way in carrying into all this stuff we've been talking about here but yeah then it's just applying different rough outs so this was to get it a little bit closer and then I roughed in from that level down around the part in the three axis so very easy to do. Just wanted you to be able to see that, yes, you can pick off of the different UCS if you've got a piece like this that has absolutely no flats to um, clear out. So can you move the part away from the chuck? I have a lot of crashes in four axes. Um, yeah, you can move the part. That's what that um, work offset we did in the machine setup was for. That's the distance away from the platter or chuck it is. So if you're working in four axis and the chuck's over on the right, and the face of that platter is the zero for the virtual machine you've probably got set up, um, which will be your, you know, on your X axis. If you go into that machine setup for that one and you go to edit and you go to that work offset, this value here will allow you to shift away from that. So let's say you're zeroing the left end of the part. Maybe the left edge is your X zero, Z zero is the center of the part, Y zero is the center part or something like that. Um, and you want to represent it. 10 inches to the left of the chuck, just go in here and put like a minus 10 inches. Um, then that will actually show the piece 10 inches away from the chuck. Or whatever that distance is away, you're going to be running it at the machine. If you have a vise on there, a fixturing, or however you're holding it on the chuck, three jaws, wherever that zero is in rela relation to the face of that chuck platter, set that value in this X distance here, and that will move it out for you. All right, sorry about that. Let me shut that phone off there. Okay, so yeah, that's where that value is at inside of there. So you saying on three axis you had to manually readjust the part in the vise. Yeah, there's um, there's a little difference between the multi-axis and the three axis. You can use the work shift to shift it around in simulation for three axis, but when you get into the four and the five axis machines, this actually comes into actual positioning to help adjust the different movements. All right, so let's go back to this wireframe piece here and talk about some of the simultaneous movement controls. So we're gonna do a basic wireframe type cut. So here again, you can see we got a piece of stock. We just made it the size of this. So now let's say we need to come in here and trim it off around here at this level here. So we're just worried about keeping this piece and all this is just the molding that we need to trim off and get rid of. So stock set up. Machine setup in this case is going to be the bottom center, like if it's sitting on a table or whatever we're doing. And in this particular configuration, um, I'm going to switch off and edit this, and I'm going to use a, where are we at here, head-head type configuration. So this means we're working with like maybe a, a gantry-style router or milling machine where both tilts or rotaries are in the head of the actual machine. I'm going to delete this out, and we're going to start fresh. So now inside of here, you're going to come down. We've got our stock. We've got our zero set. Uh, we've got our machine chosen. Uh, you can go in there, and you can set up if you are doing a work offset, and you want to shift it off of the table, you can. I'm just going to leave that for now uh, inside of here. And we're going to come in, and we're going to go to the multi-axis, and we're going to come up to wireframe. Work offset one. We're not changing any of the multi-axis settings. 
Uh, for this, maybe we'll just use a quarter inch end mill. You can sign tool holders, all that fun stuff again, speeds and feeds. And now we're going to jump over into the actual parameters. This. So when we run out of this next button, always remember to look up at the top on these when we get to these simultaneous ones. And this is where all the controls will be at for these tool paths inside of here. So for surface paths, we got drive curves and orientation lines. So drive curves. All right, what is our drive curves? Our drive curves are these edges here. Let me slide this back over so I can see if I have any layers in here. So inside of here, you can see I actually have wireframe you can pick off of as well. The cutting curve, you can extract uh, different things like that to use. So if you don't want to pick off of the solid, you can have that edge. You can just extract it using extract edges or draw it. And you can select that a lot easier. Or you could go to the solid model and go around one by one and pick those. So since I have that extracted edge, I'm just going to select that and press OK. Orientation lines. So your orientation lines are, let me get out, are what is controlling the tilt of the tool. So in this case, as it goes around, how do I want the orientation to be controlled? Um, so here I'm going to use my tool axis control. So I'm going to pick it like so. You can look at the chain. Which way is it pointing? I want it pointing to the line in this case, and I'm going to press OK. In this case, I have one because I want it to hold that same tilt as it goes around the piece. You can have multiple ones um, and then have it change its tilting as you control it as it's moving around. So you can place those at different points along the cut path at whatever tilt or angle you want. And what it'll do is as it starts here, it'll start in that orientation and it'll morph its way into the next orientation morph its way into the next and the next and so forth. So you've got a lot of control. The more tilt lines you put on there, the more control of how that tool is tilting along that path you will get. Maximum snap distance. This is the maximum distance. It's going to look for that line away from the drive curve. So if your line's a quarter inch away and you only have 0.1 in here, it's not going to see it and it's not going to work good. So you need to make sure that that distance, like if you can't get your line down all the way to that line, uh, drive curve, make sure that your distance is large enough for it to find that and use it. Are we machining on the left side of the line, the right side of the line, centered on the line, inside or outside? Those are pretty straightforward. Are we doing any offset of the line, positive or negative? Uh, you have two area containment areas, like your boundaries. You can extend and trim. Uh, off of the ends or the sides. We'll take a look at those in another path coming up. Uh, enforced cutting direction, your direction you're moving around the part. A lot of your standard settings inside of here. Tool axis control. I'm going to be tilted relative to the cutting direction for five axes. Again, you can make this a three axis cut if you needed to. And we're just going to leave the defaults. What I like to do is come through here Take a look at the defaults and make sure everything looks okay. Your link connections, I'm going to leave them as direct and direct. Um, I'm not doing a roughing, and I don't need any of the feed control zones and things like that. I'm going to come over and compute it, and I'm going to try and get an initial pass around here. So what we want to do now is we want to take a look and see what this is doing. So over here, the best way to do this I like is you can launch simulation and watch it there, or this is where the back plot comes in great. So the back plot will actually let me bring that tool in here and get a quick visual. I'll we'll just speed it up here a little bit. You can manually step it or see how that's going to be moving around inside of here. So you can see I'm on the inside of the line. Okay. So that's not what we want. We want the tool coming in from the outside 90 degrees like that to come in. So there's a couple ways we can try and change that. One of them is we can come in here and we can open all these things up and you see how all your controls. So the orientation lines... Maybe I'm going to reverse the direction, recompute it, and then backplot it. So sometimes this one didn't quite do that, but sometimes just reversing the direction that orientation line is selected will reverse the direction of the tool. So I like to check that first because that's just a quick setting. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to come in here to edit. We're going to go to parameters. We're going to go to tool axis control. Let's throw a minus 90 in there. So let's, let's start with zero. So if 90 is tipping it to the inside, and I compute it, and I do a back plot. So you can see it's coming up and going around. So zero is straight up and down, though. All right. 
So I'm going to go back and I'm going to edit. So the first thing I noticed, we're coming in from the wrong way. So let's go to links. Well, we have our retracts, and where is it coming in from? So it's got it at point 0.1. I'm going to put like three inches in here and then just recompute it. So notice now I'm coming down into it instead of being lower than the piece and coming up. Where is that from where my Z0 is on the piece? My Z0 happened to be at the bottom center of the part. So it was coming down to 100 thousandths up and then trying to go into the cut. So now it's coming down to three inches and feeding down from there. So if we watch this cut around now, you'll see that at zero, we're coming down and we're just following right on the path around the part. So now all we should have to do is tilt the tool over, slide it through the piece a little bit, and we'll have our wireframe trim. So we can go back to the feature, edit it, go back to the parameters page, go to the tool axis control. We should be able to put a minus 90 or 270, whichever you. Okay, so it's going to get me with that. So we're going to come in here and edit that. Kick me out of the tool path. So let's do... To the right. There we go. So now if we come in here and back plot this, and I'm going to go back and just go over the settings with you again, you can see I'm coming in, I'm coming down, I'm moving around. Notice the tip of the tool is right on the line, so I'm going to show you how to shift it into it. Um, a little bit to get it to cut through. But what I did to reverse that, so originally it was coming down and tilting to the inside and zero was straight up and 90 was down. What I did to change that was I didn't change the tilting, I changed the machining side. So if the left is the inside, the right's the outside. Flip it around to the right so that way my zero to 90 positive is on the outside of the piece. To shift it through, you could do an offset. You could also come over here to utility. You can do an axial shift of, let's say, an eighth inch. Compute that. Back plot it. I'm going to go to a top view. I'm going to manually step this in. So you can see this outer blue line. We can change the color of that. This outer balloon is our part, so the tool is shifted through an eighth of an inch to cut that off. So if we go up and throw a quick simulation, so these paths will just give you different ways to achieve that simultaneous cut. Wireframe trim, trim is one of the more basic ones. The reason I wanted to touch on some of the settings in here is this comes in both packages, the 5 Standard and the 5 Pro. Uh, so this one is, is a little bit more setting intense where you've got to actually control the tilts, the lines, and things like that. But you can do quite a bit. With this particular tool path so you can see this is a head head configuration where we're with my piece down here you can see it's tipping and it's bringing the piece into the table if i had my collision settings turned on which i don't right now for testing purposes um, it would stop and say hey i've got a problem here so this is where we could come in and shift this piece up um, by simply shutting this off waiting for it to close Editing our machine setup using that work shift. Let's just bring it up like uh, five inches. I don't have to recalculate anything. That will automatically get passed through the machine and the posting and the simulation to reconfigure. So now I'm five inches up off the table. So here you can see my tool. We might hit it when we go down because we're going to come down a little lower here. So you can see this is just going to drop down, go in. Tool's not long enough. We're getting a little hit there. That's showing that the holder is hitting hitting the part as it goes through there. So you'll get to be able to get all your checks, make sure everything's uh, good and so forth as it goes through. Come on, hurry up. There we have it. So I need to go a little deeper as well, I can tell by using the simulation to cut through the piece all the way. A little bit thicker wall than I was anticipating. Um, but again, you can see, that's a solid, 
probably a solid stock is what happened there. Um, but you can see very easy to come in and set up those controls uh, in there. Just kind of think about what you're doing. I like to tell people when you're going through the first time setting these up, try not to just set everything at once. Stick with the basics. Get the basic settings in there, compute it, look at it, and then you'll be able to figure out what setting needs to get changed. Sometimes when you go and go throw too many changes at a time and compute, you really don't know what setting actually changed it to get it where you want. So next time you go through there and you have that happen again, you won't know exactly what caused the correction you wanted. To talk about that a little bit more, let me close a couple of these pieces. Let's see if the software, my computer can handle another one here. I'm going to bring up this one. Now this one's going to be a little bit of everything on the uh, pro side of the five axis milling package. So here what I did first of all is I brought in a, a vice from Kurt Vice downloaded I just filed, brought it in here, got it on a layer, can shut it off um, as needed. Came in here, created some soft jaws using our new imprint feature in our three axis, created the wireframe, set the piece inside of it, did that. Created a piece of stock, as you can see, like it's sitting in the jaws uh, to be held. Came in here, picked that DMU50 machine, set up my machine setup. I do have inside of here the distance from there to the tabletop in my work offset of 8.3345. So you can see this is a whole job set up properly as it would be out at the machine for uh, machining this piece. So if you look at this piece, we've got a little bit of a kind of like a cap type uh, form to it. Uh, some curves, slants, radiuses, changing surfaces, and so forth. So the way I, I machined this one out, again, we got our stock is just a cylindrical piece. I started with a basic, select the part, three-axis roughing just down a little bit past the uh, edge of the uh, taper there. Standard three-axis toolpath, I'm sure a lot of you guys have done. So then I came in here and said, okay, now we need to work on, let's do the top first. So these are all our surface base paths in the multi-axis that I use for this. And these I use quite a bit. Really like how these tool paths work. So this one here is cuts along a curve. These let you pick a curve. Remember, curve means wireframe, lines and arcs, or edges of surfaces. And define a path over the drive surface you pick uh, perpendicular to it. So the way this one worked inside of here is this is just a 3 8 ball end mill. And the curve is your lead. So what I picked is you can see just that edge down the center of that top surface. The drive surfaces are always the surfaces that you're cutting. So in this case, it's just the surfaces I want to cut. And you want to make sure the normals of the surfaces are always facing out. Otherwise, it will toolpath on the inside of the part if that surface is facing inward. And there's options in the software to reverse those as you need. So then in here, I didn't offset it. I did extend it using my extend off the ends and the sides. So these give you the ability to extend, so I'm cutting that surface nice across the top, past the radius a little bit for a nice blend. Um, I'm doing a zigzag pattern, 15,000 step over. All of these surface based paths will give you the ability to set not just a step over, you can actually define it by the cusp height that's left of the tool. Uh, there's even some nice options in here on how it sees the chaining tolerances and so forth. The tool axis control be relative, tilted relative to the cutting direction. Uh, I'm just doing it straight up with this one, but you can tilt off uh, forward and back or side to side off of these. Um, and these, you do get a lot more controls on how it's looking at the tilting. Um, so you can stay tilted to a normal of the surface, to a fixed angle, to an axis. Uh, this is another popular one because this I can stay normal to an axis. I can define a tilt and I can maintain that tilt. And you'll see that on... Uh, a couple of uh, the next tool pass I do so that way my head is not do or my table is not doing a lot of unnecessary tiltings around I'm tilting off to the angle I want it and then I'm just running around the piece a little more efficient cutting there how is that tool interacting with the piece am I auto tilting it am I keeping the center tip to lock to the surface uh, a lot of nice controls you can do with that you have your gouge checks I should be clear of everything I don't have any surfaces to avoid or tools but you can set up gouge checks and surfaces to avoid inside of here. You have all the links along the cut. You can set the step overs, and then if you're roughing it, you can set the step downs. Remember, you have different retracts and heights you can set inside of here. All of these are located from the part zero 
keep that in mind when you're doing it, but you have different types of retract shapes and heights that you can call out. Um, and then your more advanced lead in and out options that you can run inside of here as well on how it's actually entering in and off of the part. Remember, you can turn any of these into roughing if you want to use these as roughing and you have a few things like feed control zones and shifts and so forth. So this was just a quick little uh, cut back and forth across the top using the multi-axis controls. So then the stand-up walls are going to be down the sides of this. This actual one here is one I use probably more than anything, and it's the morph between two curves or edges. Work offset one. You can see it's the same tool. So my first edge I pick was up around the top of it. It can be the edge of the surface or wireframe. My second edge is going to be down at the bottom of the radius of the wall. So what I was looking for here, you can see my drive surface is what I'm cutting, is the ability to follow that top shape, morphing to the bottom shape as I step down the wall um, and complete that cut. I'm using the edges and uh, in the calculations there, or you can do it by number of cuts. I'm not using any of the other controls. One way, you can spiral down it, which you'll see. And then I'm using the tilted with angle to Z at 35 degrees tilt, and I'm maintaining that. So if we take a look at this tool path here, which is this one, and I bring the back plot in here real quick just to show you this one. So you can see how the tool is tilted off, but it's maintaining that 35 degree tilt off the Z. I'm, it's not changing off of the normals of the surface and stuff like that. So now I'm just getting an efficient movement around the piece using my five axis uh, tilting to cut that in. So then once we did that one, came down here to the dome, pretty much the same thing morphed between two down those shapes with the maintain tilt, a little different degree control there. To go down the body here, um, pick the whole thing, use top of job, bottom of job, advanced Z level in a spiral. So that's a continual Z spiral down the part. Uh, and then you'll see there's another multi-axis. I decided to come back in and morph between two the radius up at the top. Now these are great for doing 3D of radiuses, whether you're using your multi-axis or three-axis. Uh, this one inside of here is the morph between two. Come on, internet. Let that go. There we go. <laughs> Sorry, a little internet delay. So you can see I picked the top edge. Now this one, I picked the bottom edge. But you can actually, you know, you can extend off of that. My drive surface is just the radius there. So then you could come in here and give it all your controls. And this is actually spiraling down it too. So I'm not disengaging from that surface the whole time I'm cutting it. So we'll come up here and start the simulation so you can see this. And when you have any vices and soft jaws and things like that, set as the work, uh, the work piece in the cam tree, remember to make sure those are visible when you launch it to the simulation so you'll be able to use those. So right now you can see our part, but then we want to be able to show our vice in our table. And you see how everything is located at 8.33 number that I had put in my work offset for my Z to tell it where the zero was in reference to that virtual machine zero. So when we set up that machine for you and we install it into your software, we're going to let you know where that's at. So that way you can set up all your jobs and simulations and everything inside of here. So I'm going to skip the three axis roughing. You can use your move list. This is a just standard three axis. I don't think we want to sit there and watch that run through. So you can see I used intermediate steps to get a nice rough into the part. This one here will slow this down. Um, this is going to be that first tool path we saw, uh, just cutting back and forth across the top using the different five axis tilting methods. I do have a question that came in from Richard, which I'm going to answer in just a moment. But you can see we'll speed this one up and skip by that. So that's doing the first one we did, which was the uh, parallel to curve. Now we're doing a morph between two. This is the one with the maintained tilt of the 35 degrees. So you see we're not changing a lot of tilting of the machine. We've kicked off to the angle we want, and now we're just rotating around and moving around the piece. Really nice way to have the ability to keep that unnecessary movements. I can run more efficient. 
uh, this way and maintaining that tilt. So then when we get down to the body here on this one, a little fast forward, same thing, but now we're maintaining a different tilt just to come down the body here. You'll see these actually really do produce a nice cut part on this, uh, uh, this piece here. So we'll skip down to the next one. I think I go back up to the top and do the little radius up at the top next. So this is the same thing. This one's doing the, uh, it's a little slow there. This is the spiral, so it's staying engaged as it cuts the radius down the piece. And then it's going to flip it back to normal, three axis, advanced Z level, spiraling down this piece here, constant engagement, spiral down the tapered wall to finish out the piece. So nice tool pass, nice operations, just a few things to show you what's going to be coming up in a couple webinars we have. Uh, all of these tool paths and settings can be transitioned to the different modules we have of the software, the, um, the three axis premium, just got to eliminate the tilting. You can use all these controls and some of these surface space paths and that. When we start getting into the mill turn, uh, multi-axis lathe controls, same tool pass, same concept, just on a different type of machine. So start thinking about those, but really, really should be able to achieve uh, some nice tool pathing options when brought together properly. So just start thinking about the different tool path types, how they're actually designed to cut, um, the different controls. Again, a lot of those surface-based ones will give you the same result. It's just what do you have to select? That's why I always look. I don't concentrate on the name of the toolpath because those toolpaths can be used for so many different things. I always look at what do I have for selection? What is it going to generate for me as an output? And then decide how I want to use them. So just a little overview there. I um, wanted to cover some of the basics of the five-axis milling in the different areas we offer in the software. Uh, from simple indexing to simultaneous. Uh, what I'm going to do now is open it up for questions. If you guys got questions, go ahead and type them into the questions box and we'll go try and answer some of them for you. But Richard had a question. He said, there are times I draw tool, tooling like you, your vice and jaws, and they are both uh, become joined and the same color. How are you keeping them different colors and on different layers? Well, I just created them uh, and worked with them separately. So if I get out of this, I'll explain that real quick. Now, you'll see when I go to the transfer it into the simulation, it's all made the same color because it was selected as the workpiece. But if I come over here and turn off my solid, there's my jaws, there's my piece. So what I did here is if we get rid of the soft jaws, I just imported in the vice, obviously, from Kurt's website, deleted out their jaws, got rid of the bolts, all that stuff, didn't need it in there. You know, whatever I want. I just wanted the vice, the solid jaw, and the movable jaw. Created my soft jaws, and I positioned them in there using translation between points. Got them in position here how I wanted them. Notice they're on different layers. And by having them on different layers, they are actually individual solids, too. Um, I don't have them all as one piece. I made one solid, and I made another. Um, set the piece inside and differenced it out of both of them. Um, so these are all worked as separate models um, inside of here. By having them on the different layer, there is no tie to each other. So I can change the colors of one versus the other. The only thing I have to do is when I'm ready for making sure everything goes to simulation, you select everything as the workpiece. So that way when we go into the simulation and we turn on, make the workpiece option visible, you'll be able to see it all. And you have to have it on the screen before you launch the simulator. But yeah, by keeping these on the different layers, working with them as individual solids, you can come in, change just the color of one piece if I wanted to, and, and just save it. So just work with them all as separate solids, separate pieces. Nothing says you can't have 50 different solids placed together like an assembly in the software um, and work with it that way. But good, good question on that um, as well. I can actually show you this one here. Uh, documents. Been doing this too long. Got more parts than I know what to do with. This is another one I kind of did that example. Um, so here you can see I just made them a little bit lighter color, so that way I could tell them apart. But how I created these, again, is created a couple rectangles of my jaw size and sunk the part into those to the depth that I want. And then in three axes, you have the imprint option now where you can pick the chains, you can pick the part, set the thickness, which I did two inch, and it will do the extrusion and the difference for you automatically. 
So really great way to make up some quick draws, fixtures, do some Boolean operations fast um, to do that inside of there. And then it gave me my nice jaws to uh, work off of. You can copy and paste those into another cam tree, do the machining of those, or whatever you need to with them there. Good question. Other questions? Hopefully I didn't jump around too much. I did have a few different topics I wanted to cover. Again, apologize. We had a, a little bit of a scheduling mix-up. I had to jump in and cover for Mike today. I wanted to make sure we get a good overview of the five-axis milling. Like I said, he'll probably be diving into the different topics of more in-depth on the indexing, the controls, transform, rotate, coordinate rotation, things like that, um, as well as the surface base pass and, and of that nature. A lot, lot we can cover in the multi-axis milling portion of the software, as well as other topics um, and modules that might be thrown in in between them. Um, but watch for a new list to be put up of our um, schedule for the upcoming year and months. Um, again, anybody has ideas, topics that you're curious about seeing, don't don't hesitate, send those in to us. Uh, we definitely pass those along for upcoming webinars as well. Um, yeah, schedule for the new year is being worked on as we speak. Keep checking back over the next week or so. You should see it up on the website or get an email with what's, uh, what's coming up with those. I was just talking to them about that this morning, and they're working on getting that compiled and, and up for you. 1 p.m., 2 p.m., yeah, 1 p.m. is a good time. There was a little uh, uh, confusion. I know Al used to like to do, I think, the 1 p.m. times. Uh, Mike, I think, likes the 2 p.m., depending on our lunch schedule and what we're doing. So we'll talk about that. Maybe if we can't do 1 or 2, maybe we'll hit on 1.30. So, yeah, send us your, uh, send us your opinions on those. You know, we're, uh, we definitely want uh, input on those and uh, pass them along. Um, but I'll, everybody send it in with their options here. I'll, uh, I'll pass that along to them as well and, uh, and let you know on that. But, yeah, good. That's great information to pass along to them. But, yeah, keep, keep tuned. We've got some great things coming in the software. Really show off some of the power and functionality of it. It's uh, a lot of things you can do with it now, a lot of controls, a lot of ways to use it. A lot of people aren't thinking about uh, try and help you think of outside of the box with it. Um, but again, yeah, thanks for everybody attending. And if anybody doesn't have any other questions, we'll go ahead and wrap up for today. And don't forget, for those of you that can't make these webinars live, they are recorded and placed up on the website that you can watch back. So any of these you do miss, um, just make sure you log into the website, use your, your login uh, information, and you'll be able to go to webinars and watch pre-recorded ones and watch back over any of these that were posted. But again, thanks again for everybody that's attended, and we'll talk to you at the next one.